I watch. I just watched Mulholland Drive last night for the first time. Did you ever see that one? Nope. David Lynch. Yeah. Film. I want to. I want to see everything he's done. Yeah. Was, he was good. It was very interesting. Very Lynch. Yes. Yeah. Very Lynch. Yeah. Um, it's. I think it's one of the ones that you have to see multiple times. To right. Really, to really understand, understand what it. you just watched. Right. Um, but it was. Uh, yeah, it was, it was good. It was, yeah, I, I think I would, to fully understand it, it's just, I would... I watched to, uh, Triangle of Sadness How was that? this week. It's fan-freaking-tastic. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good stuff about yeah, that. Yeah, it is, it is, I, my... I'm my, get to that one. My thoughts on it is, it's, it covers the same kind of stuff, sort of, as everywhere, everyone all, all at once, but in a completely different way, yeah. and it's, it's freaking... Yeah. It's great. Just... Hey, welcome back to our stupid direct suits of Corbin. I'm Rick. And you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter for more juicy content. Thanks to Patreon. So, felt good to get back to the gym today. Felt good to get back to the gym today. It did. Everybody. It's been ten days because I had the cold, and you don't know, work out when you're sick. I do. And uh, I was, you know, what I was listening to. What? We'll be here all week. Today we got a uh, video. This is called Quartersons of Ancient India. Ooh! Flirting with the throne. Yeah, baby! It's a little informational video about old time quartersons. Quartersons. Quartersons? Quartersons. It's a medication. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> let's just get into it. Three crores to bring your mouth close to mine. Touch my lips and kiss. Yeah! Hot damn! Me tight to touch my place of love Ooh! and get to total union. Listen well. You must bathe me in a shower of gold. Wait a minute! Donald Trump would love these Wait people. Wait a minute! <laughs> deeply rooted in the historical fabric of India, from ancient times to the colonial. There's so many films that have quarters on them. concubines, dancing girls, musicians, actresses, or sex workers. These women had a surprising impact on the world around them. Oh, I bet. For among the courtesans of India were those whose honeyed lips changed the fates of empire. Goddamn right. And influenced the culture of the subcontinent forever. First, it's important to clarify, not all courtesans were involved in prostitution. In India, courtesans were a particular category of women who were not expected to have a traditional married life. Courtesans who served as concubines or musicians or dancing girls or actresses would not necessarily have been considered prostitutes, but they would also not have lived like others in society. For example, they wouldn't have had a husband, barring a few notable exceptions. That being said, many Indian courtesans were engaged in at least part-time sex work, just like the courtesans of other cultures. In feudal Japan, for example, actresses would perform theater and would then be hired for the What's night going on here? suitors. This Why would block that out? Would not have been unfamiliar to an Indian courtesan. A system of prostitution is a feature of an advanced, prosperous society. After all, the profession relies on a substantial economic surplus, much of which is generated through trade and commerce. And extensive commerce demands a complex and stable political infrastructure. Unsurprisingly, systemic prostitution thrived in places like ancient Greece and ancient India. In India, there are references to prostitution as a social institution as early as the 8th century BCE. There Oldest even profession in the world. References some hundreds of years after that in early Buddhist literature, especially the Jatakas. There, we find detailed discussions as to the categories of courtesans, their services, fees, and position in society. How courtesans entered this lifestyle is quite varied. Some would do so voluntarily, of course, but others were given as gifts. Others were born to courtesans. Still others were sold into courtesanship due to financial distress, or were abducted, or even won as war booty. Booty. Yeah. Courtesans could be delineated into a number of different categories. Some of these categories may seem rather strange given our modern sensibilities. There were concubines and live-in mistresses, and there were common public women who sold their services on the street and in their homes. Vandaki were housewives turned prostitutes whose husbands were dependent on their earnings. Runda were pilgrim women pretending to be engaged in penance. They were typically older prostitutes hunting for customers at religious sites. Like your mom. These colorful characters notwithstanding, the most prominent courtesans were the Rupajava and Ganaka. 
Rupajava were courtesan prostitutes whose value was premised mainly on their beauty and charm. By contrast, the Ganaka were a rank of courtesans who were not only expected to be beautiful and charming, but were also accomplished in the arts and intellectual so pursuits. So like Rekha and Umrah John. As the status of household women deteriorated by the early centuries BCE, the accomplished Ganaka became especially attractive to cultured men about town, known as Nagarika. Nagarika were typically merchants, nobles, administrators, and military lords the sort of men who would be able to pay the exorbitant fees demanded by high-end courtesans. Some of the most learned women in Indian society would have been courtesans. In Jain literature, we find exhaustive lists of what a Ganaka was expected to learn, including arithmetic, writing, chess, music making, perfume making, horse riding, cooking, camping, sword fighting, and omen reading. Altogether, 72 skills were to be mastered by a Ganaka, and they put these skills to good use. At the height of the Vijayanagara Empire, for example, a genre of erotic poetry referencing Krishna as a mischievous customer was popularized by courtesans who had a talent for the written word. Hmm. Many of these poems have been preserved in the Tirupati temple vaults in Andhra Pradesh. In fact, there is plenty of reason to believe that courtesans in India were valued for their artistic and intellectual achievements, and not solely as sexual objects. As Altakar writes, courtesans had a peculiar position in ancient India. As persons who had sacrificed what was regarded as honorable in a woman, they were held in low estimation. But society treated them with a certain amount of consideration as the custodians of fine arts. Men who had a liking or love so you for respected music them, but you also looked down upon them. Not delight in the company of their own wives, who had ceased to possess these accomplishments from 400 BCE. Though despised in one sense, courtesans began to be respected for their achievements in the fine arts. Aside from the fact that some courtesans were expected to be highly educated, they were involved in a multitude of public and private functions. Courtesans would also be brought along on hunting and military expeditions. In 1520 CE, at the Battle of Raichur, for example, Krishna Devaraya brought along thousands of courtesans to entertain his troops at camp. Broadly speaking, courtesans Sex were entertainers. Life. From various <laughs> texts, we know that they would perform at festivals, garden parties, boat trips, musical soirees, and other venues. They also served as party hosts themselves for discussions not unlike those of the French salons that captured the world's imagination in the 1700s and 1800s. At homes could be held in a courtesan's salon, where assembled were men of the same age, intellect, and wealth. These men would hold discussions with one another and with the courtesans. This was called ghosty, where they talked about poetry and ghosty. art and indulged in food and drink. The kingdoms and empires of India were invested in training up and maintaining courtesans for a multitude of reasons. Substantial taxes were collected from brothel courtesans and freelance courtesans alike even those who were being paid to be the mistress of a single client. Textual sources indicate a 25 to 30% tax rate on courtesan services, with that number rising to 50% in times of administrative crisis. As an accomplished and attractive courtesan could generate considerable revenues, the state undertook to supervise courtesan education at its own expense. Those who teach prostitutes, female slaves, and actresses the arts, such as singing, musicianship, reading, dancing, acting, writing, painting, mental acuity, the manufacture of scents and garlands, shampooing, and the art of attracting and captivating the minds of others, shall be endowed with maintenance from the state. These state-funded teachers would also be tasked with training the sons of prostitutes to be chief actors on the stage. Interestingly, courtesans, actors, and their relatives would also be trained in spycraft. <laughs> they were taught how to conduct counterintelligence operations against foreigners, such as visiting diplomats, and how to identify local criminals for police. Courtesan-related services were not their only contribution to society, however. Records in many South Indian temples show that the Devadasi courtesans there made rich endowments. In Buddhist texts, there are many references to courtesan charity, Courtesans fed the hungry during famines and gave away property to monastic orders. The courtesan Amrapali gave away her vast wealth to charitable institutions and laid a vast sum at the Buddha's feet. In Jain texts, we hear of many generous courtesans Gee, who were invested in the public good. One ran a picture gallery, while others gave vast sums to the poor. When the courtesans grow rich, they often set up works of public utility, such as wells, temples, tanks, gardens, groves, 
bridges, and they gave away food and rice. What does this tell us? That they were better Men then than the Congress wealthy, of the United States they were in now. Control of that wealth, and they could decide how to spend it. These women are of loose character, and they live in the best streets that there are in the city. They are very much esteemed and are classed amongst those honored ones who are the mistresses of the captains. Any respectable man may go to their houses without any blame. High-end courtesans were extremely wealthy and politically influential. First-hand accounts observed that their wealth even exceeded that of landed nobility. Well-to-do courtesans also kept slaves and employees to assist them. Because men like to have sex. Many courtesans would employ a Vita, a man who would look after her physical interests. He would escort Especially when they don't have to earn it themselves, they can just pay for it. As a go-between and goods procurer. Some courtesans would also share a portion of their earnings with a matron, who would help her with negotiations, help navigate administrative issues, and much more. Given the high demand for entertainment services, Ganikas would often maintain a troupe of singers, dancing girls, and artists to entertain at larger parties and festivals. These assistants were known as Ganikadasi and could later become independent courtesans. Ganikas also had maid servants or slaves who would help with house duties, makeup, hair, and fashion. In the Samajataka, for example, the document notes that Sama, a courtesan, had a retinue of 500 female YouTube slaves. YouTube would block the video. Ownership of slaves was not merely an ancient practice. For example, medieval sources in India note that Vijayanagar's wealthy courtesans often made use of female slaves as personal assistants and co-entertainers. Besides the advantage of their earning potential, courtesans also enjoyed the protection of the state. Those who harmed them, physically, financially, or socially, were liable to be punished in accordance with special laws created to protect courtesans. In the Arthashastra, Kautilya notes that a state-endorsed official, the superintendent of prostitutes, conferred the title of Ganika to we a select of group of yeah. courtesans who were pretty... That's what I think a lot of kids culture. say they want to be when they grow After up. After being granted this title, a, lot of school. a Ganika would be entitled to funds from the state to establish herself. Kautilya huh. seems to have harbored no I'll give you some seed funding. Courtesans, and in fact was adamant that they be provided for by the state. <laughs> In the Arthashastra, he recommends that courtesans be given state pensions so as to take care of them after the loss of their youth, beauty, and entertainment skills. The possibility of courtesans falling in love was accepted by Vatsyana, though he advises them to chase after money and influence, not love. In both Indian literature and recorded history, we find ample evidence of courtesans reaching the highest rung of society by securing the hearts of great kings, nobles, merchants, and others. For example, the legendary Vijayanagara emperor Krishnadevaraya was the son of Tuluva Narsanayaka and his beloved concubine Nagamamba. In fact, Krishnadevaraya's status as the son of a lowly concubine should have disqualified him from becoming emperor were it not for the fact that his half-brother instated him as his successor on his deathbed. Once he was made emperor, Krishnadevaraya then married the love of his life, a low-caste dancing girl known as Chinnadevi, with whom he'd carried on a secret relationship prior to ascending the throne. Krishnadevaraya married Chinnadevi and made her a queen, the queen he adored above all others. <laughs> In North India, yes. similar histories abound. Yes, Among the Rajputs, queen. for example, Raja Samant Singh fell in love with a beautiful courtesan, Bani Thani, who was a singer employed by his stepmother. Their love blossomed due to her beauty and their mutual interest in the arts. The Raja made Bani Thani his mistress and later married her and made her a queen. In the Kashmiri erotic text, Kalavilasa, a story is told of a courtesan, Vilasavati, with whom King Vikramaditya fell in love. In this story, King Vikramaditya lost his kingdom and fell on hard times. He stayed with Vilasavati as a guest, and it was Vilasavati who, with her extensive contacts and powerful networks, helped Vikramaditya regain his kingdom. Returning the favor, Vikramaditya married her and made her his chief queen. But the story doesn't end there. Vilasavati was in fact in love with another man, a young thief who was imprisoned. She confessed to her husband Vikramaditya, and he accepted it. He freed the young <laughs> oh, thief okay. and allowed the two lovers to be united. Wow. That's not Modern common. How in India avoid getting pregnant and giving birth? In Crocodile the Indian continent, poop. ancient and medieval peoples used many different methods of birth control. For example, the ancient trade in silphium, a popular and extremely effective contraceptive in the Roman Empire, 
almost certainly reached Indian shores. However, the expense and rarity of silphium, which went extinct in the 400s CE, made it an unsustainable solution. Hmm. Other plants belonging to the same giant fennel family, such as Asophytata, were cheaper and more readily available. Lab tests show that they have potential as a contraceptive. Meanwhile, in Indian erotic manuals, there are references to the Queen Anne's lace plant, which has contraceptive qualities. Other references include a consumable mixture made of powdered palm leaf and red chalk. As in Egypt and China, pessaries were used as a means of physically blocking conception. Ooh. One popular pessary was made of honey, diluted rock mm. salt, ghee, and ground fennel seeds. Ow! When mixed together and heated, it creates a spermicidal solution rather comparable to those sold in pharmacies today. Dang. Certainly, the popularity they figured of it out. Well, the ghee and the honey <laughs> could come the in handy. Control methods used in ancient and medieval India were likely effective. While imperfect, these methods would have provided they got a lot of yeast infections. some control over pregnancy. Yeah. There's also another form like that they could have used, which is subscribing and called pulling out. I don't know. They really helps the channel out. I've also I don't know if they knew about that. Profile, so that also doesn't that always work. You can though. leave tips, <laughs> make custom requests, purchase unique offers. It's a, a good video. That was a very good video. Uh, a lot very, of info. Well, I mean, it's it's not. Uh, we see them a lot in oh my stars in Indian films, whether it's old or new. Yep. The especially the historical ones, the corazón. Mi corazón. Mi corazón. Mi corazón. It went from cortisol to mi corazón. Cortis cortisons. Uh, in TV shows, films, all that throughout India. Uh, and I think before the British, obviously, they, were, they weren't they were as, um, I don't know if prudish is the correct word with sexuality. Oh, my stars, no. But the, I the, think if the Brits imported something, it was prudishness. Yeah. Um, with, with all the, the, the conservativeness around women needing to cover up and also sex in general. And Absolutely. Obviously, India famously has probably one of the most, if not the most famous sex book. Yep. In history. Yeah. <laughs> it's astonishing. Um, it and so really they, is astonishing. They've always been really open as a society well, until obviously more until recently British. because of the british yep. influence yep. on the society puritanism um, which is where we get it from as well yep uh he, even though obviously we're, we're a little not as much anymore obviously no <laughs> even in the past in the past 50 years it's a whole different country but obviously we come from the british and the yeah. christian conservativeness around sex yeah uh misunderstoodness in my opinion i, I agree uh it, it comes from them but uh it's it's super interesting because yeah it, especially i love, love the spy album one i'd love to see a, a historical yeah one about that and I, i'd really like more detail in terms of the differentiation between how many of them because it's it specified this that many of them chose to live that way mm -hmm. versus the ones that were just sex trafficked and sold yeah. and were just sex slaves some chose there because yeah. that's good money oh great money uh, good influence yeah um and and stuff like that and and super interesting obviously i know there's certain countries that have legalized prostitution mm -hmm. i think it's one of the things that could i could make an argument that it should be done here because you're not stopping it by making it illegal no and you could also regulate it better <laughs> as well you're never going to get rid of the black market there's always going to be a black no. market whether it's legal or it's illegal like when weed was illegal yeah you, you didn't stop people from doing it you know you could also tax it so you couldn't i'm just no and so and people there's many people who've talked to the fact that you know, they've said, well, if you legalize it, you're going to stop the sex trafficking. That's not true. No. So, uh, Amsterdam is loaded with sex trafficking. No, 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 no. But for me, the thing that's confounding, like so many of the laws in the United States of America that make absolutely jack shit sense yeah, are stupid. Porn's legal. Prostitution isn't. Both involve pay for play. No, you don't. People are getting paid to have sex mm -hmm. in both worlds. Mm-hmm. Because of, it's literally only because I know, of the conservative if, society. If there's a, if there is a person who's like, yeah, you can pay me to have sex with me, and the other person says, hey, I'd love to pay you to have sex with you, where is that the government's business? Is my my feeling. Yeah. Um, I just not the, whether you agree with it or not is immaterial. Yeah. It's just the basic reality of. I've never understood why that has a level of conservativeness in the society. Yeah, and it's because we don't want that to be. 
that in our society. I mean, yeah, you but shouldn't it, have to pay for sex, kids. But it is once again the oldest profession, and it, it yep. will never it will never go, go away. away. People will always have sex and always want to have sex, and there's people yep. that can't or just don't want to try. And and there's people who are addicted. There's people who have healthy, happy marriages with kids, yep. and they still go find hookers. Yep. Um, I, I don't understand it, but you're not going to get rid of it. No, people aren't going to stop having sex. No. They're going to stop having kids. Well, but they're, <laughs> and they're, the other thing is they're not just going to stop having sex. They're not going to stop being interested in what is taboo. Mm -hmm. It's just you, you, you're you never going to stop it. Yeah. Uh, that was really interesting. I think it should be legalized because your mother deserves more work. She, well, and she deserves better pay. I agree with you. I mean. And we should be able to tax her, God damn it. That's what I'm saying. Anyways, uh, great video. Let us know what other informational videos uh, that we should react to are down below. Just